this sort of rather general outreach that we did um, to all schools and kids centers um, developed a team from local people, demobilized soldiers, young people out of the war, many have had who'd had their educations uh, interrupted by the war. We trained them to work with children in things they could do safely. The therapeutic methods we adopted were ones uh, that were not therapy, they were therapeutic, and we adopted them so that the people that we were training could implement them well. Singing songs, composing, dancing, moving, all of these things we did. I would never again do it like that, it was too hard, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I'm in glad we did it at least once. Um, then we did build a music therapy center in the Pavarotti Center in Mostar, and some pe people in this room were absolutely key to that director of the City of London Festival, Ian Ritchie. Thank you, Ian. Uh, his vision uh, and fantastic capacity to make things happen well got the, the center going. People like Julie Sutton, who'll be with us later on. Uh, I think Julie's here. Uh, uh, Liz Murphy is gonna be here later. A whole list of people. It will be too, uh, too long a list to credit them all here. Forgive me for not mentioning everybody, but a whole lot of people who work very hard on this. Um, and um, we did, therefore, move towards being able to do proper focus clinical music therapy, and then had a, a very, very important pyramid. At the top was clinical music therapy, at the bottom a general outreach. We could refer both ways. That was the, the model, and as it worked, it worked well. Um, so uh, we were able to do that. Um, then our methods went elsewhere, which I'll describe. We were invited to Kosovo. Uh, I, we've worked Chechnya and a lot in Palestine. Uh, as you'll see later, child soldiers in East Africa. Um, the methods uh, uh, spread. Um, uh, I must say as quickly before we get on to uh, quickly some of the, the, the science behind this, um, as we have uh, members of the army here, um, I just wanted to thank, I want to do this more formally tomorrow, uh, uh, but we had fantastic support from the army as aid workers. I did not envy the situation the army had been put into. I thought that it behaved within that difficult situation. Tremendous honor. We never lacked a guard for a convoy. We never lacked you know, the, the means to build things, to move things. Everybody was fantastically honorable. And also, whereas many of the military units of other countries in Bosnia-Herzegovina were engaging with the mafia and paramilitaries uh, um, covertly or overtly, uh, the British Army uh, kept its nose completely clean with great dignity and congratulations on that. Very proud of that. And um, thank you to the army musicians. The Green Jackets worked with us. The band of the Green Jackets worked with children in a place that was actually quite dangerous at the time uh, uh, to, to do wonderful things with us. So I just, I will make a more formal thanks tomorrow. But nobody's told the story. Uh, and there's a big vote of thanks to go to individual soldiers uh, uh, who served in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So um, moving on to quickly to the bit that's really dangerous to me, the science. I'm an amateur scientist. Uh, the origin of the word, of course, is love. I do love science, but I'm also not particularly competent at it. Um, so uh, first of all, we needed to reflect on what we'd done. Practice went ahead of, uh, of our theory here, very much so. We were achieving and doing things that were clearly working, uh, but we didn't know why. And we had a responsibility to find out why. The conventional diagnoses, I'm sure we'll come across this many times today, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, the DSM-4, Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, American Psychiatric Association. Um, uh, there's now DSM-5, but we were working from four. And there are four criteria, uh, diagnostic criteria, clusters, as it were, of symptoms. One is to have had a traumatizing experience. The second is to have traumatizing recall. Uh, the third is to have a kind of numbing or avoidance, perhaps, of emotional issues and people and contact. And the seemingly paradoxical fourth one is actually hyperarousal, being always on alert. Um, we obviously had no way of diagnosing what we were doing, but diagnoses came later. And for example, there's a, a, a very important study, um, Goldstein, Wampler, Wise from the Harvard School of Social Medicine, 1997, who did a longitudinal study of, uh, of children of the precise population we were working with and found 94% of the children satisfied these criteria uh, for trauma. Um, I also regard it as a wider thing as well. And this is where the humble 
musician. I just has to apologize for um, being grandiose. But uh, there is a wider context uh, of human experience that this belongs in. And for the sake of musicians and practitioners, I prefer to look at it in the traditional biopsychosocial model. But for music, I would add tremendously important psychobiological what's happening where the brain and body meet. Um, psychosocial, that's very obvious, where the mind and society meet. And the one everybody forgets about, biosocial, very important, where our biologists are affected by our social experiences. Um, so that's the sort of model that um, I work on theoretically, and I'll go through uh, what we've, we've found. So biological concerns. Here's some work uh, in North Uganda. Uh, this is the um, uh, Kitgum, and this is very recently, but fortunately, a situation has now improved considerably since we were working. Uh, this is the Lord's Resistance Army campaign, Joseph Kony, from the forests of the Congo in North Uganda. A terrible experience for North Ugandans, because on the one hand, the LRA is a kind of Acholi liberation army. Uh, on the other hand, of course, it was a partner in massive brutalization of villages with the Ugandan People's Defense Forces. Uh, uh, child abductions, prostitution into soldiering, massive movements of populations. So what you see here is on the top is uh, displaced children we're having some fun with. Uh, I'm working with musicians of the Uganda Dance Academy there. And down, uh, this is an ex-child soldier. Uh, uh, we're working with some painting and music there. Um, anyway, what about the biology? Here it comes. Um, first of all, um, I'm very interested in the physiological symptoms because having observed my children, I see these in their behavior. First of all, um, we all know that, uh, that uh, trauma has an effect on heart rate. Um, this is largely from uh, research in the American military. Um, but on the whole, five to seven beats a minute faster the heart goes when you're traumatized chronic, chronically. And of course, heart rate varies. We're talking about averages here. A varying heart rate is a healthy one, but one that gets stuck or permanently registers on average six, seven beats a minute faster is a problem. Um, now, to put this very briefly, um, music is very interactive with the autonomic nervous system and with the heart. Um, uh, there is a mass of evidence suggesting that music can speed up and slow down your heart. Um, and we, our hypothesis, as yet to be disproven, um, is that through musical exercises we can help in, uh, as it were, regulating behavior of the heart. Because you don't even have to move. If I had time, we'd demonstrate it right now. Uh, uh, so it, it doesn't even, for children who are traumatized physically, uh, it doesn't even depend on being able to move. Um, it can be activating your motor cortex and be activating your, your autonomic nervous system. It's highly, highly uh, interactive, um, both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Music on the whole is parasympathetic. It can arouse and put tone into the sympathetic division, but the overall long-term result is usually parasympathetic. Um, but anyway, we can exercise children's hearts. How do we do it? With music that changes tempo and feeling, fluid journeys in tempo and feeling for children. It is a prosthetic of our heart that human beings invented at, the, at their emergence as a species. So we should use the heart prosthetic music um, uh, as, as, as we can. Um, then, um, a massive evidence for this. This is, this is all, by the way, this is not pie in the sky. This is all Cochrane Library meta-analysis. We can quote this over and over again. There is no question about this. These are replicated experiments, peer-reviewed over and over and over again. Breathing. This is very poorly reported in the, rep in, in the literature on trauma. Um, uh, but uh, anybody who's worked with children in the field um, knows. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a grotesque parody, but knows this effect on children. Um, uh, we know the, probably the reasons for this. It's to do with also vagal pathways and anxiety and so on. Um, but one of the things with, with music, we have a totally magic bullet for breathing. On the one hand, um, uh, the circuits of neurons in the medulla oblongata that we think control and the feedback mechanism with the walls of the lungs and other things are breathing are highly interactive with music. There's a very strong research on this. Uh, when you're unconscious of breathing, not aware of your breathing speed, music will probably alter it to what temperament music is. So we can exercise in that way. But more important is this. 
Um, when we're sitting here, we're using 20 to 30 percent of the capacity of our lungs. When we're working hard, 60 to 70 if we're lucky. There's one activity that uses 100 percent of the lungs. Singing, if you sing well. Oboe playing too, by the way, but singing. Um, and so we do a lot of singing with children. And also we can help with control of breath. So for example, working with children in Bosnia, typical song I would use like this, <clears throat> teach. Tashun, tashun, tanana, palamachka stavana, ogrebala hasana, shuti, shuti hasane. First time, and then a week or two later. Tashun, tashun, tanana, palamachka stavana, ogrebala hasana. And maybe a week or two after that. Tashun, tashun, tanana, palamachka stavana, ogrebala hasana. We can teach and encourage breath control, and we've had some great results with this. So, um, uh, there again, a part of trauma research, in my mind, underreported um, breath, breathing, but very important, and we have some nice results of music. We can't heal anything. We can heal nothing. We can help with the symptoms a little bit. That's what we can do. We can't heal it. Um, this regulation of movement repertoires, um, we've, anybody who's worked with children with trauma knows that there are different sorts of repertoires. There is the sluggish repertoire, the head down, the avoidance, and then there's the, the full-on ADHD repertoire, um, uh, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, and only recently has the comorbidity of ADHD and PTSD been recognized in literature, but it has been, and uh, any, any practitioner knows it well. So what do we do? Well, we help the children regulate themselves through music itself. Um, uh, music has a, a, a very direct contact with our capacity to move from the most primitive level, but thank you for blinking, uh, the acoustic startle response. Uh, from the hardwired, uh, straight from the inferior colicus, basically, uh, spinal into neurons, um, sound, a sudden sound will make us jump. But to much more sophisticated relationships, as brain scanning has shown um, uh, many studies in fMRI, activation of premotor cortex, things of this kind, uh, where we have um, uh, music having a strong relationship with, with movement. Um, and we can use this for children. So what do we do?